The end of the world has come to Baldur's Gate, but not in the form of a grand apocalypse. Instead, it comes as Michelle Mindfreak, who will evolve to even greater heights and use her newfound powers to fight ancient dragons imbued with world-shaking power, destroy battalions with just a single thought, and maybe even rule the world. But before that, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe and go check out the previous parts here. With that out of the way, on to the video. Once on the road to Baldur's Gate, Michelle settles down for an evening to plot her eventual takeover, when all of a sudden our beloved dream visitor calls for aid and some astral assailants appear out of a portal to attack us. They start by blasting us with attacks, causing our body to flail around, but we've been through worse. We just get up and cast Sanctuary before meandering on over to the portal over a couple turns as her enemies watch on. As we arrive on the other side, we see even more Gith trying their darndest to break through our dream visitor's defenses, and naturally we rush to our wondrous waifu's aid. Unfortunately, there's some folks in the way, so without much of a second thought, we jump into combat as they're in the midst of blowing up friendly intellect devourers. How peculiar. On our first turn, we immediately fall into our routine of resistance and then concentrated blasts to start ticking away at them. Our brainiac brawlers actually don't do too bad themselves with a couple of hits, but they get rumbled pretty fast in return. We do our usual as it gets back to us, as unfortunately, with a couple of flurries of blows, these malicious monks take out our last two thralls. Which means their attention turns to us, and we quickly find out that even when their blows do land, thanks to all our damage reduction, they really don't do much. So we get a sea blast away in peace. Well, they do pretty much nothing. This person even misses us three times in a row, well prone. After a few turns, we get the first of these wannabes, and just a little while later, we get the next one too, with no trouble. Before we move on to saving our dreamy nighttime visitor, we cast light for our cow's glow ring, heal up, drop a sanctuary, and forget to cast resistance due to the hurry we find ourselves in. Regardless, when we arrive, we find a friendly and beautiful Mind Flayer that we feel a strange kinship to. Our suspicions are immediately confirmed when he reveals he is in fact our dream visitor, and this is his true form, and for better or worse, the tentacles are really doing it for Michelle. A anyways, with him looking like that, how can we refuse him help? As the fight begins, all of our foes immediately start laying into our intellect of ours, instantly killing all of them before any of us on Team Evil even even get a turn. In retaliation, the Emperor, as our dream visitor is called, gets a beautiful mind blast on two of them, stunning them both, while we do a classic sea blast on another before heading towards an edge in the hopes that the goons follow us. They do, but first they drop a gnarly fireball right on our heads. The Emperor, on the other hand, wastes his turn dominating one of the enemies without realizing their stillness of mind feature will break them out of it at the start of their turn. We keep blasting bit by bit and also get a bit of healing from a potion, all while luring our enemies ever closer to the edge. Michelle even attracts the attention of yet another goon, who keeps hitting us with a pushing attack, which might be scary since we're close to a ledge if it weren't for our Reaper's Embrace preventing us from being moved. It doesn't stop them from dealing a buttload of damage with it on a future turn though, which just means we gotta dust ourselves off with our channel divinity and then finagle ourselves into the perfect position for a repulsor that gets two of our four opponents down for the count. From here, we're a lot less worried. The Emp does take some hits and continues to waste his domination, but we just heal up when we need and blast, blast away. One more of the goons even gets lured over to the edge and we get this one with a force tunnel, leaving just the head haunt show. Admittedly, it does take a while to get them since they're resistant to psychic, but they simply don't deal enough damage by themselves, so eventually they get got. When the dust is settled, the Emperor tells us all about himself and his past, even from before he was a mind flayer, back when he was an adventurer like us, before he took a tadpole to the head. We also learn the imprisoned Gith here is Prince Orpheus, and it's his power that keeps us both from falling to the Absolute's control. We'll have to get our hands on that somehow. To talk things off, we're also given an extra tasty looking tadpole that should evolve us even further, so bottoms up. Power surges through us, and in the words of the Emperor, we become exquisite. This allows us access to the outer ring of illithid powers, and we immediately have enough tadpoles for all of them, and boy is there a lot of them, so let's do a bit of a rapid fire round. First up is fly, a passive that lets us fly, forever, whenever, obviously insanely good. Then we've got fracture psyche, this lets us reduce AC by 1 for 5 turns if they fail a save, and if we kill them while it's active we get to use it again, not great. Illithid expertise is another passive that grants us expertise in persuasion, deception, and intimidation, we already have most of that though, but hey, it doesn't hurt. Next up is psionic dominance which once prolonged rest lets us counter any spell cast with a level equal or lower than a proficiency bonus, which is pretty handy, though not crazy powerful. Black Hole, on the other hand, is both crazy and powerful. It is a massive AoE that guaranteed pulls every enemy towards its center and has a chance to slow them. It recharges on a short rest, but after you use it the first time, it says you can use it up to five more times. Now, I don't think that's quite accurate, because for me it seems that you could use it as many times as you want in the next five turns, and with two bonus actions per turn, that can get a little out of hand. Mind Blast is another pretty good one, firing off 
off a high psychic damage cone in front of us once per long rest with a chance to stun. What's not to love? Mind Sanctuary we never really use, though it once per long rest lets you make a small area for a few turns that lets folks use actions or bonus actions interchangeably. Free cast is a good one that I mostly just forget about. It's a toggleable passive once per long rest that lets you ignore any cost such as spell slots when using an ability. Really no reason not to use it, just need to remember that it exists. Absorb Intellect is a cool one that should an enemy fail their save once per short rest, we reduce their intelligence by 1 and heal for an additional 1d8 per turn it's active. That means by the time it's 5 turns are up we'll have healed for 120 HP and our enemy will be down 5 intelligence. Last up is Displacer Beast Shape, which lets us turn into a Displacer Beast once per long rest. With 3 attacks per turn and the killer bonus action, there's plenty of situations this little beastie will help us out. After that we take a very bloody sleep and when we awake we grab our Resonance Stone which does continue to work and we hit the road to finally arrive in the city, where we're immediately beset upon by the most heinous creature in our journey so far. We tell her to bug her off and hopefully that's the last we see of her. Unfortunately, as we continue our journey, we're stopped by yet another nuisance, a guard who insinuates that we're a refugee of all things. Michelle tells her to clear off lest she face a mad mind freak, which just results in her calling for backup. Uh, well, no time like the present to test our new powers. One guy gets really scared and blows himself and us up, but for the most part it's clear these folks are just not gonna hurt us. So when it gets to us, we drop a stage fright on most of them and then turn into a displacer beast to at last make some sweet, sweet attack rolls, immediately taking one out and hurting another. Even with stage fright, we get absolutely wailed on, teaching us that our AC is just too low when transformed to tank this many attacks and sending us back into Michelle form. So we go into defense mode with absorb intellect on the steel watcher to get some passive healing, as well as shield of thralls and resistance. A surprising amount of hits land and break our shield which stuns everyone, leaving them ripe for a black hole pull into a beautiful mind blast, shattering almost all of their poor little brains. Uh, except for the Steel Watcher, who's immune to Psychic. That might be a problem. On our next turn, we finish off one of the goons before heading to the edge where we plan on sending the Watcher to the rocky shore below. But then it just kinda dies. It took me a second to realize what happened, but it ran out of intelligence and just dropped dead. So that's that problem solved. The last fella gets taken out in just one blast from full health too, thanks to our absurd call the weak threshold. A little further down the road, yet another guard gets in Michelle's way, and this is just getting ridiculous. Sure, they've got a drawbridge, but we can fly, so that's exactly what we do, and no one really minds. Once inside Worms Rock Fortress, we meet Lord Enver Gordhash, who doesn't seem to be getting along with Orin and asks us to kill her in exchange for us teaming up in order to rule the world. We're not blind to how beneficial this situation is to us, so we agree, though once the time is right, even Gordhash will bow before Michelle. He also lets us know we've got an imposter among our camp, so I guess Withers has some explaining to do. Either way, after watching his coronation, we head into the city proper at last, where we go straight for the Storm Shore Tower tabernacle and speak to Vicar Humble Toes to buy the reviving hands. These make it so when we heal any creature it gains resistance to physical damage, as well as also giving some various unimportant revival based effects and a plus one to strength saves. The resistance is really nice though, especially given the amount of damage reduction that we have, keeping in mind it applies before damage reduction. So if we get hit by a 13 damage attack we'll have it down to 6, then take 2 less from our armor, 1 less from our defender flail, and 3 less from heavy armor master, making it so we actually take 0. Obviously insanely good and will be replacing our wondrous gloves. It's made even better by us heading to Sorcerer's Sundries next and buying the Ring of Regeneration from Laroakin's projection. This little trinket lets us heal 1d4 at the start of each of our turns, triggering our new gloves and also getting maxed out thanks to our periaptive wound closure for even more insane tankiness. We'll be swapping out our Bless Ring for this one. Since we're here, we decide to head upstairs and have a chat with Laroakin himself, who as it turns out is interested in the Night Song. He's got a contract out for her capture and since we're in desperate need of money, we let him know that we'll be coming back with her in tow. Before that though, his tower seems relatively unguarded so we just fly down and start looting it for all it's worth. While looting we grab some very valuable and very powerful thaumaturgic tomes, one of which the Tharkiate Codex curses us but we're very easily able to fix that with a remove curse granting us the Tharkiate Codex blessing permanent buff. This little blessing grants us 20 temp HP at the end of each long rest for a nice little boost. Then we go off and sell our findings, leaving someone else to get cursed but hey, withering away other people people's souls is the best way to earn money, don't you know? Speaking of withered souls, we decide to go check in on the local carnies, and after negotiating our way inside, we find Boney of Stony and Boney's Creations, a local statue maker. If there ever was a tyrant worthy of a statue, it's Michelle, so for the low price of 5,000 gold, we order one ship to our camp. This grants us another permanent boon in the form of Sweet Stone Features, which is more or less just a permanent bless, granting an extra 1d4 bonus to both attack rolls and saving throws, a very powerful feature to have all the time. As we go to check out our new statue, we get a bit of a jump scare in the form of Yenna, who's begging us to 
let her stay. Still, we don't want this creature anywhere near us, so we tell her to leave and she responds by threatening us? You're lucky the game won't let us murk you, kid. When we go to bed later that day, here she is yet again, unfortunately. Good lord, this is turning into a horror game. Oh, thank god it was just Oren. Whew, I was worried there was an actual child in our camp. She tells us if we don't kill Gortash for her, she'll get rid of the real child, and I mean, that's extra motivation for us to stay with old Gordy. Thankfully, after denying her, she disappears, and we don't have to deal with that wretched disguise anymore. The next morning, we continue our spending spree by getting a long-awaited makeover. Now, all shall tremble before Michelle. And we finish up by heading to Ferg Drogher in Rivington to buy the Hellrider longbow. We don't have proficiency with it, but we can still get its benefits. For us, that pretty much just means a plus three to initiative rolls and advantage on perception checks, which is better than the nothing that our current ranged weapon gives. Can never have too much money though, so we go tell Dame Aelin about Laroakin and how she should really go see him, which she isn't too happy about. But she also seems to think we're on her side in all of this, so off she goes and we trail after. We roll up looking all fly to the Big L's crib, where we at last reveal our betrayal to the Night Song. She takes a moment to pray and we just kind of, uh, let her, causing a bunch of Moon Maiden groupies to show up and fight alongside her. As the fight kicks off, we learn the gimmicks of it pretty quickly. Each of the 260 held minions she summoned concentrate on a moving globe of invulnerability centered on Aelin. They also have a reaction that deals 12 to 144 radiant damage that can be used when we damage them on top of dealing an extra 5d8 radiant damage on each of their regular attacks. Who boy. We start off by using a black hole to pull two of them off the edge, but they don't take any falling damage. Then we resistance and dash into the globe. Lurokin's goons are, in a word, useless. They miss terribly, always, and Lur Laroken himself doesn't really do anything either. Aelin, on the other hand, is smart enough to move us out of her globe on her turn, so it doesn't look like we'll be hiding in there. Her goons also start using banishing smites to immediately remove Laroken's ineffective elementals from the fight. In the hopes we can help our temporary allies hit, we use Fracture Psyche on one of the moon goons, but even that provokes the reaction dealing an absurd amount of damage. So we just get blasting and heal ourselves that way since they're always concentrating on Aelin's globe. Another round goes by mostly uneventfully, but on our turn we end up surrounded by two baddies and needing something to give, we cast Sanctuary on ourselves before flying downstairs and pressing the security button to cause Laroakin's turrets to appear. And they join on the side of Aelin. Why? Just why? Well, whatever. We just down an elixir of radiant resistance and call it a day. The elementals whack an invulnerable night song, Laroakin launches a fireball and takes more damage in return than he deals, and we stare in confusion as our allies start to get finished off. We just take another turn in Sanctuary to heal up and watch more of our allies die. And then Laroakin also just fireballs and somehow how teleports below, I, I don't know what's happening. Seeing our not so magnificent mage down there gives us an idea though, and we try and go below, which removes us from the fight, and as we're trying to get back into it, he flies back up and then dies off camera in a comically short amount of time. We show up just in time to see our celestial combatant casting sacred flame on Laroakin's corpse. Seriously, what is going on? The zero health fire elemental shows up again to fight back before getting disintegrated. What? What? Michelle gets back into the fight with a stage fight on one of them, as well as a blast on another, and Aelin just keeps hitting Laroakin's corpse. And we realize the Moon Goon's attacks can be Sionic Backlash for a ton of damage before blasting some more and healing. Our last buddy gets finished off, kinda. He's still standing there, I don't know anymore. When it gets back to us, we keep up our blasting, before using another Sanctuary to take a time out. Only to come back in with a Mind Blast on two of them that hits just one, and a Sea Blast to further damage them. The fight continues to fall apart at the seams, however, as Aelin starts shooting a different corpse and the Zero Health Earth Myrmidon starts dashing in place. Finally, I stop reeling from the strange events and think long enough to realize that if we provoke the attacks of opportunity from our foes before blasting them, they can't retaliate, which honestly kind of just solves the fight by itself. We also learn they can't reach us if we stand on this floating table, which means we could take them out this way, but we stick with opportunity attacks and then concentrate a blast since we take less damage that way. Once a couple are nice and low, we transform into beast form to finish them both off, and then a few rounds later take out the last with a sea blast, leaving just Aelin, who as you can imagine does not do better now that all of her backup has been dealt with. With no one left to pay us in this room full of corpses, we fly down and use one of the buttons to teleport out of here before the turrets decide to start open firing. I um I don't even know what to say about that fight. Let's just let's just pretend it was a fever dream and forget about it. Moving on, we've heard tell of some great secret beneath Worms Rock, so we get investigating. And thanks to our heightened mind, we're able to quickly realize with a couple well-placed lightning arrows on these torches in the prison, we can reveal a hidden passageway. Inside, a statue asks us if we're worthy, and I mean obviously we are, but still before we can advance to the end, it needs us to prove that fact 
contract with a series of trials. First up is the Chamber of Courage. We just need to pick up a torch and not die for four rounds, which is made very trivial by Sanctuary for obvious reasons. The enemies just kind of stand around and growl, and before you know it, the first chamber is done. Next on our list is the Chamber of Strategy, in which we need to finish up a chess puzzle, but we know Michelle is quite the plotter, so with just a couple moves, that's another chamber solved. Inside the Chamber of Justice, we find quite the tricky conundrum. We get told a story about a thief and have to figure out what the just punishment is. Only problem is there's a cursed judge stopping us, so we start by removing the curse on them, and then after thinking real hard about what a just person would do in this situation, pass our judgment correctly, of course. Last is the Chamber of Insight. There's three folks inside with varyingly heinous ideas, and we need to kill the one with the most heinous, so we just murk the person with the most similar idea to ourselves. With that, the locked door to the basement opens up, and we get enough experience to hit level 9. Since we no longer need more spell slots, we decide to dip back into Rogue to hit level 4 and get a feat, which after a lot of deliberation, we settle on Shield Master. This grants a plus 2 bonus to deck saves while we have a shield, and if a spell forces us to make a deck save, we can use our reaction to half the damage on a failure or take no damage on a success. Shield Master is by no means a great feat, and I'm sure there were better options, but I figured it would fit our tanky theme, and something tells me it'll be handy in the very near future too. We also get a plus 4 to our proficiency bonus as a nice boost as well. Before we continue on too deep, we down an elixir of lightning resistance just to be safe due to all the lightning themed stuff in these tunnels. Just down the way we see a big old dragon corpse that I'm sure will stay dead and past it we find the helm of Baldurin which reveals the way out when we pick it up. This helmet lets us heal two more hit points at the start of each of our turns, grants crit and stun immunity as well as a plus one to our AC and saving throws. All in all, very good and we'll only get better for us later. Since we're here we decide to go loot the dragon as well and oh, oh no that was a mistake. Somehow it overpowers our freakish mental capacity and uses us like a puppet to speak. Turns out the Emperor is actually Baldurin himself, founder of the city, alongside this dragon who was once his very close friend. Seems they had a falling out when our illithid companion went all tentacly, which resulted in Onsers, the dragon's death. Now it's time for round two, and we're acting as our man stand-in. The fight starts, and there's a couple of water myrmidons that teleport towards us and don't do much else. We ignore them and get blasting on the dragon, who uses lightning breath on us and the elementals in return, as he always will. For some reason, our shield master didn't trigger though, and before you say it's not a spell, keep watching. Michelle also learns Steeped in Bliss doesn't work because he's undead, and he reduces all damage by four, so we're gonna be here a while. To finish our turn, we use Stage Fright and Recast Resistance. As the turns go on, the elementals start healing the meager damage we've actually done, so they've gotta go first. When we bait Onser into attacking the group of us, our Shield Master triggers this time. I was completely stumped what caused this at first, but eventually I realized it only triggers on successes for some reason. Either way, it does work, so at least there's that. And then with a Mind Blast, we finish off the Malevolent Myrmidons and stun Onser. The rest of this fight is as straightforward as it gets. We use good old Concentrator Blast on him to deal a max of 14 damage, and he blasts us in turn with a Lightning Breath that we often block. Fast forward a million rounds, and the deadly undead dragon takes to the skies to launch a super attack. Thankfully, there's plenty of crystals all around the arena for us to hide behind, and we take no damage. Then we're back to the old Slugfest. He can never actually deal enough damage to be a threat to us with his regular blasts, and when he takes to the skies again, we just fly into this corner in the secret exit, causing the blast to whiff. With him posing no real danger, it is, as most of our fights are, just a matter of time. So after, I kid you not, 111 rounds and an hour and 45 minutes of real lifetime of nothing but consecutive blasting, Onser finally falls. Good lord. After that ordeal, it's about time we kick back and take it easy, and as we're walking by the ocean side, we find good ol' eye poking Volo about to get blown to pieces. Since he owes us a lifetime of servitude after what he did, we decide to interfere. As the enemies lay into us, it becomes immediately apparent most fights that rely on primarily physical damage just aren't going to be a problem for us. We free Volo with a well-placed arrow, get them all grouped up with a black hole, and then obliterate most of them with a mind blast. It's not hard to clean up the rest of the fight from there. After that, our ocular obliterating orator is eager enough to head straight to our camp where he'll live out the rest of his days. Well, the beachside walk didn't work out, so we head to the pub, and the emperor wants us to go investigate the basement. Ah, uh, okay. When we arrive in said basement, a bunch of our kin have already infiltrated, which means it's up to us to deal with them. This fight is a little more complex complicated than the last fight because they have portals that pour out goons, but we can just one-shot each of the portal manning fools and then it becomes pretty much the same as the last fight. Though slightly longer since most of them resist our mind blast, but they still can't really hurt us and their spells never work either. Which means it's time to get a blasting, as they quickly learn that Michelle's not trapped in here with them, they're trapped in here with her. The Emperor gets really happy with his hideout being cleared out and uh, we finally get that sweet unwinding that we wanted. Our meandering ain't done yet though, we wind up at the house of grief and with the 
a name like that, it's just gotta be a Sharon front. Sure enough, when we indulge in their services, they try and out mind freak us by reading our thoughts, and when we press the lady on it, she reveals our suspicions are correct. Unfortunately for them, there's only room for one evil goddess in this town, and it ain't Shar. So we swing by the Steelwatcher Foundry and grab one of their helmets to see through any magical darkness they might conjure up. Then we head back to the shadow strewn Sharon shack and get a fightin'. Even though the odds look stacked against us, we can still one shot the weaker members of the cultish cloister, and when we do get hit, it barely affects us thanks to an elixir of necrotic resistance. Just like our last couple fights, it gets pretty much entirely dealt with by another very satisfying black hole, followed up by a mind blast. A repulsor a couple turns later calls down a good chunk of the rest, then a displacer beast speeds up the fight even further with a sea blast that brings it home. Our rewards are threefold. First is Viconia's Walking Fortress, a plus three shield that gives advantage on saves against spells, makes spell attacks against us have disadvantage, and lets us use Reflective Shell, which bounces projectiles back at their source for a couple turns. It also has a special shield bash and warding bond, but those are useless for us. All in all, maybe the best shield in the game and makes us even tankier, not that we really need it at this point. Next reward is enough experience for level 10 and 6 in Cleric. Other than more spell slots and another channel divinity charge, we get Blessed Healer from our subclass, which makes it so when we heal with a spell, we regain an extra 2 plus the spell level's worth of HP. Funny thing though, for some reason this also works on the Helm of Baldurin and the Ring of Regen, treating them as level 1 spells, meaning we now heal an extra 3 from each of them for a grand total of 12 HP per round. To make ourselves even more unkillable, we do some investigating and read about a mirror that steals and grants memories, then we find said mirror just down the hall, and after only one check since we read about it first, we trade in a minus 2 in strength for a plus 2 in con. And despite the strength loss being fixable with a remove curse, the constitution gain is permanent. Now it's about time we get on track with dealing with Orin, starting by tracking down the presumably forgetful assassin that left this very convenient list of people he needs to murder in order to join Orin's cult. Michelle finds him just down the street in the midst of murdering. Unfortunately, he instantly bounces, and we're left cleaning up his cronies. Thankfully, the next time we find him, he's more willing to stand his ground, and another fight kicks off. Pretty funnily, he instantly paralyzes us and then proceeds to do nothing, which is a great indicator of what most enemies are capable of from here on out. But with another good mind blast, and then a few rounds of sea blast, this fight gets got. For our efforts, we get another handy note telling us where to go next, and a bag full of hands. At our next destination, we meet Saravok Anchev, the fella in charge of the murder tribunal for Ball's cult. He asks us to talk about how we murdered the folks whose hands we stole, and we easily enough lie our way through this conversation. Whereupon he asks us to murder a celestial in exchange for joining a cult, and while the only god we want to serve is ourselves, it's hard to pass up murdering a celestial. So we become an unholy assassin and gain access to the temple where Orin is hiding. Michelle finally remembers aid exists and adds that to our usual prep before facing her, and arrive just in time to see her taking out the kid she napped. Which definitely has us wanting to jump into a you and I are alike monologue, but instead we jump into a fight. Before we can properly hurt Orin, we have to stop the ritual her followers are performing that give her 12 stacks of unstoppable every turn, which means we start black holing them off the edge. Orin can deal good damage if she knocks us prone, but thankfully that's pretty unlikely and doesn't happen often. Most of the time, she just doesn't do much. Our black hole manages to get most of the ritual casters, but for whatever reason refuses to knock these two off the edge, so we get one with a repulsor and the other one with a force tunnel. This does stop the ritual, but it means we have no way to knock Orin down into the pit, so we've gotta do this the long way. It is pretty funny to watch the Sisyphean struggle that our squirrely stabber goes through as they try and hurt us. Eventually, we do finally blast her to bits, quite literally in this case, and grab her another stone. And this time, it only took 43 rounds. Now it's time to tell Gordy the good news. He's stoked to hear it, but also tries to intimidate us into handing them over. When we refuse, he reveals that he was just being a wily little prankster and yanking our chain before heading off to the sewers to await our arrival. We could go deal with all that right now, but there's still some other folks in town claiming to be the ultimate villain, and we need to prove them wrong. Starting with Kazador Sar, a lord who's totally not a vampire, but just has a penchant for red and black and skulls and bats. To get to him, we've got to make it through this big old scary door, but as we arrive, we first hit level 11 by blasting the closest bystander. This grants us level 7 in cleric, which means we get 4th level spells, including death ward. This makes it so the first 
time we get reduced to zero hit points while it's active, we instead drop to one as a nice little last resort. To make it through the big old door, we first read a dead dame's dictionary and then steal a family crest off a of foggy at rest. When we do open it, we meet a werewolf who makes the same mistake many of Michelle's victims have, trying to tell us what we can't do. I'm sure you can guess how that one ends up going for him. Upon descending into the basement, we find some imprisoned vampire spawn who beg us to save them, yet at the same time doubt our abilities to take Cazador's staff to do just that, but we'll show them. In addition to the usual prep, we also drop a protection from poison and necrotic resistance elixir on ourselves just to be safe. Then we head to chat with Cazador, who is very excited to show us his ascension ritual in action, which naturally we aren't gonna let succeed. It's easy enough to stop by heading straight over to the weakest link, some random level 1 vampire spawn named Asterion, and instantly disintegrating him. Then we pick up the ashes, stuff it in our handbag, and ship it off to camp with same day delivery. While it does stop Kazador from ascending, for some reason he's still getting the benefits as if Asterion is still there, which kinda blows cause for each ritual source he deals an extra d10 necrotic damage and gains more temp HP. Chatter teeth one of the goons tries to put us to sleep, which we resist and use psionic backlash in return. But that just means we've got to focus on taking him out, as we mind blast before sea blasting the chattering man himself. Cazador also starts using call lightning on us, which is the only real way we take damage, but it's never enough for us to actually worry. In the midst of bullying the skeletal spellcaster, we get a good repulsor taking out most of the goons, learn mage hand can stand on the ritual source to block it, and stage fright thanks to the extra bonus action from Asterion's source. On one of our turns, we also start using black holes to fling enemies off the convenient edge, and in the process learn that whenever we stand back on Asterion's source, it gives us yet another bonus action, seemingly infinitely. There's no fun in abusing that, though it is nice to know about, so we just kill Chatterteeth the old fashioned way. With him out of the way, we also decide to take care of the rest of the goons, so the turns go by a little bit faster. Now it's time to start trading blows with Kazador himself, who only does things every other turn, giving us more than enough time for our passive healing to keep us topped up, combined with Sea Blast healing. Odd behavior for sure, but I'm not one to look a gift Kazador in the mouth. Fast forward to the 47th round, and we make Kazador sorry that he ever messed with us. We use our favorite illithid power, a dagger to the heart, to finish him off, and just despite the loser stuck in that cage who said we'd never get his staff, we break it, trapping them to an eternity of ravenous torment. Sucks to suck. Mr. Sar wasn't the only big villain in town. We hear Raphael occasionally makes this place a stomping grounds, and if there ever was someone who needs to get knocked down a peg, it's him, so we set off to the Devil's Fee, and find exactly what we were hoping to find by breaking in upstairs, a magic circle for conjuring up a portal to the nine hells, complete with all the ingredients we need to make it work. All it takes is a little trial and error. We jump on through the portal and arrive in Raphael's domain, the House of Hope, where we're greeted by Hope, seemingly the embodiment of the concept, so we know she's gotta go before we're through with this place. She asks us to free her from Raphael's torture, and we tell her we'll get right on that, in exchange for a disguise and access to the house, which she happily grants. As we get exploring the house, we find ourselves in the archive, where we meet the archivist, who is more than happy to ramble about all of Rafi's most beloved belongings. Mentioning something called the Orphic Hammer being his most prized, which is reason enough for us to steal that on our way out too. It's got a barrier around it right now, but that doesn't mean we can't steal the other couple artifacts lying about, which does admittedly break our disguise and alert the master of the house, but we're not the ones who should be frightened. When we step outside of the room, the other denizens engage us, including a giant ball of hellfire which has 250 HP, ignores resistance and immunity, and is immune to psychic damage. Okay, maybe we should be the ones afraid. Michelle starts blasting the folks that we can damage, and we immediately fly away from the ball, which makes a whole other horde angry at us. Thankfully, this horde doesn't really have their hearts in it, with the Cambian Harlap just snarling at us because he can't deal enough damage to hurt us, and all of the many imps spending their turns missing every single shot. Some folks also start blowing up on us. Well, Ball, God of Murder, approaches ever closer. On our next turn, we give them all a bit of stage fright since they're already missing, and it works better than expected since for some reason their agonizing blast damage is hurting themselves. Unfortunately, they also reflect radiant damage back doubled and as fire on the first instance of taking it. I didn't realize it was only on the first time though, and kinda panicked and took off our callous glow ring for the rest of the fight, even though, let's be real, we're nowhere close to dying. Either way, a killer repulsor takes out all the injured imps, and so long as we can deal with this ball, maybe with a displacer beast, we should be good. While keeping our foes at bay with black holes and thinning them down with blasts, we end up heading inside the boudoir, where thankfully the ball can't get us in the bath, which at the very least solves the problem temporarily. We get the last of the ineffective imps, as well as the cowardly Cambion, before realizing we used our displacer beast form in the werewolf fight earlier. 
Uh oh. The ball continues to stare us down as we try and think of what to do, when all of a sudden a ploy occurs to us. To start, we use a potion of angelic reprieve to take a quick power nap in the bath and get a short rest. Don't do that at home. Then we lure the ball over to the balcony and use our refreshed black hole to make it rain down on some poor sod far below. And conveniently enough, inside the boudoir are some taps that give us a long rest with just a click of a button. Also inside this room is a button that reveals a hidden safe, and inside the safe, a letter that reveals the magic path to grab the Orphic Hammer. The second we leave the room, a haunting and rotund figure appears behind us yet again. We flee back towards the balcony and with another black hole continue ruining whoever's below this ledge's day. As we clean up the rest of the house, we get enough experience for our final level up. Level 12 and level 8 in Cleric grants us more HP, more spell slots, more radiant damage on melee attacks, and our final feat, Tough. It's a simple feat that grants us an extra 2 max HP for every level that we have, basically just granting another 24 max, making us super Super duper extra tanky. Now that we're in peak form, we head back to the archive and grab the Orphic Hammer so that we can free Hope and make Rafi extra mad after taking out her guards, which thanks to the Displacer Beast form goes pretty quick. With one whack here and another whack there, Hope gets freed nice and fast. Since we know Hope isn't gonna last through what's coming, we also get her to conjure up a chest full of goodies for us beforehand. And then, with our usual setup and an elixir of heroism, we go to exit the house. Surprise, surprise, as we go to leave, Raphael appears along with a 40 health dwarf who is very outclassed and our old game-breaking nemesis, Yurgir. The head honcho proves himself to be a little more relatable than expected with his initial ranting. Yurgir throws away his last chance for survival and the much-anticipated assault kicks off. Hope immediately gets cooked, literally in this case, and Raphael is very proud about the fact he killed her despite him seemingly previously wanting to keep her alive, I don't know. On our first turn, we immediately start leaving the room while our sanctuary is still active, hoping everyone will follow. Raphael is a little stubborn, choosing to hang out in this corner instead, but everyone else trails out of the room. It was admittedly unexpected that he'd stand there doing nothing, but we don't take it for granted and start blasting at the fools who followed us out. Gorilla dies from full health with us just kind of glancing at her, while the others fail to do much of anything to us. We get a mean black hole mind blast combo to speed things up before blasting down the weaker ones. Oh, and Yurgir is also here, doing not much. A dozen or so rounds later, and basically every single goon is dealt with, while we still have full health. Michelle tries to finish off a Yurgir who does get revealed by our eye this time with a force tunnel into a pit. Unfortunately, he refuses to go anywhere. This does, however, anger Raphael enough to come out of hiding, which is just what we were hoping for. We fly back inside the main chamber where a couple little dudes run Raphael had summoned are waiting for us. Either way, we shut the door and use a scroll of arcane lock to buy us 10 turns of freedom inside this cozy little room. Which means it's time to start wreaking havoc as a displacer beast, and since Roth was nice enough to leave behind some goons, we also down a bloodlust elixir, letting us on the following turns use them as fodder to give us an extra action, before eradicating each and every pillar that Raphael fuels his power with, making him in the end a weak little devil man crybaby. Once we're through, we re-drink an elixir of heroism, and since we've got just enough time left on Arcane Lock, we also use a potion of angelic slumber to both disrespect our foul foes and gain the benefits of a long rest. As we open up the doors to a very sad master of hell, Yurgir decides he no longer wants to be visible, which is fair, and stops making saves against our invisibility seeing eye, which is not fair. We try and use black holes to yeet him off the edge to no avail, and as such are left tanking hits from both the big man and the cheating Orthon, which stings quite a bit. In retaliation, we use Mind Blast to stun him, and go for one last Hail Mary black hole, which doesn't work work out, and another debtor that had been summoned turns into an imp on top of us, so we teach him a lesson in manners, and drop a reflective shell for extra safety. Good thing we did too, cause our narcissistic enemy burns through his soul charges only to damage himself. With Yurgir hiding away, we don't have much of a choice but to start blasting at Raphael, who makes it clear how little he enjoys that. It's nothing a good healing potion can't fix though, along with a black hole mixed in every turn to slow, which does cause the big boss to waste his turn jumping. On the rare occasions the Orthon doesn't use invisibility, we continue going out of our way to blast him. And now that we've burned through all of Rafi's soul charges, he's stuck melee attacking us, which means we've become immortal once again. Michelle's next turn is spent with a repulsor to reveal Yurgi, as well as a sea blast barely not finishing him off. So we go back to blasting the dastardly devil for a small eternity while we wait for his underling to slip up. Eventually, slip up he does, by wasting his bonus action jumping, granting us our ultimate vengeance against the one that got away. About another 40 or so rounds of this happening goes by before his master joins him in the pit alongside his hope. Imagine thinking you can out-villain Michelle. Ha! <laughs> Besides absolute dominance, our reward for this fight is the Helldusk armor. This 21 AC armor grants resistance to fire damage, immunity to being
being burned reduces all damage by 3, grants the ability to fly alongside automatic proficiency, and when we succeed a saving throw, the caster receives burning for 3 turns. This is technically non illita damage, but it's pretty minimal, and after beating the hardest fight in the game on our first try, I really wanted to see just how absurd our survivability could go. In case you were curious, this puts us up to 27 AC. Since we've done all we need to do, it's time to become a god for real, and wrangle the netherbrain under our control. We meet up with Gordy, who is freaking out. It's our last chance to get things under control, but the netherbrain appears bigger than ever before and pulls us into its psyche, where it reveals this was all part of its master plan as it has grown strong enough to resist the netherstones. Despite our best efforts, it resists our overwhelming power, causing Gort to steal our netherstones and I think it's time to betray him after- oh, wait, uh, n never mind, thanks netherbrain. Right before it can do the same to us, our tentacled husbando shows up and whisks us to safety. While we're stuck recuperating and replanning, the netherbrain enacts its hostile takeover. The Emperor reveals to us that in order to defeat it, it must be an illithid that wields the nether stones. We happily agree to turn into one and at last achieve our ultimate form. All shall fear Michelle Mind Freak. And to make things better, we get a nice morning snack too. With our transformation, all our powers get upgraded along with unlocking some new ones, but there's too many changes to go over right now, so you'll just have to see them in action. We arrive just in time to group up with our many allies and give a rousing speech. And yes, this is really how the scene plays out. I didn't change a thing. Also, don't ask why our tentacles are so, uh, rigid. Then we saunter towards the Netherbrain's army with the Emperor in tow. No need to be smart at this point. Especially when we can wipe out half of them with a single black hole now that it damages. The rest of this fight is likewise explosive, and there's no breaks for us since our actions and bonus actions are interchangeable now too, on top of our sea blast no longer requiring concentration and dealing loads of damage. Now that the army is cleared, we've got to climb towards the Netherbrain before it's too late, while a Nautiloid rains fire down on us. Good thing we can fly? Sure doesn't make this part a whole lot easier. Yet for some reason, we still physically climb the brain stock. Never too late to get some cardio in, I suppose. Unfortunately, as we reach the top, a dragon shows up alongside a bunch of illithids to bar the way. These illithids are nothing compared to us, though, and we obliterate them with just a couple black holes and sea blasts. The dragon can't even damage us thanks to Shieldmaster, and crumbles in the face of mind blasts every turn, along with more overpowered sea blasts. Once everything is clear, we use the nether stones to reopen the portal to its psyche, where we can weaken it for real. As we arrive inside, we toss the resonant stone so the aura only affects the nether brain. Then we get the emperor to use a globe of invulnerability scroll, which apparently catches the brain bozo inside of it. Could've fooled me. On our next turn, we just cast it a bit further back so it only affects us, and the platforms we're standing on. Then we also use a speed potion, as well as fierce perilous stakes on ourselves to expand our crit range and grant extra psychic damage on each attack, and turn into a displacer beast. We start swinging and get mind broken, which basically means we don't get a multi-attack, but we've got the Emperor with us too, to sea blast away. The mind breaking keeps up on sequential turns, but we really don't need lots of attacks to bring the brain nice and low. And once we've got it right where we want it, Michelle goes back to illithid form so we can finish off the brain with one last concentrated blast, for old time's sake, proving once and for all we are the peak of psychic power. With our dominance proven, the nether brain surrenders, begging for us to wield its power and spare its life, and boy do we love it when they beg. We use our strength to take control of it and ascend to our rightful throne, where no one will dare defy us again as our power becomes at last absolute. In my name. Thank you guys so much for watching. Here's the stats for Act 3 alongside some fantastic artwork by Cute Whittle Frog on Discord. In case you're curious about the one death, it was just a trap in Laroakin's tower. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed Michelle's journey. It was quite the doozy. Stay tuned for our next playthrough, which will be a Lone Wolf Warlock. The live stream should start a couple days after this video goes up. And as always, a special thanks to our storyteller tier members, Bunny Warren, Player 5, Damon, Larry Renzokukin, The Big Yeet, LeFay, and Mark Rainbow.